Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the earnings conference call of Dalmia Bharat Limited for the quarter and year ended 31st March 2024. Please note that this conference will be for 60 minutes and for the duration of this conference call all participant lines will be in the listen only mode. This conference call is being recorded and the transcript may be put on the website of the company. After the management discussion there is an opportunity for you to ask questions. Should anyone need assistance during the conference call please signal an operator by pressing star then 0 on your touchstone phone. As a reminder all participant lines will be in the listen only mode. Before I hand over the conference to the management I would like to remind you that certain statements made during the course of this call may not be based on historical information or facts and may be forward looking statements these statements are based on expectations and projections and may involve a number of risks and uncertainties such that the actual outcome may differ materially from those suggested by such statements on the call we have with us Mr. Puneet Dalmia, Managing Director and CEO, Dalmia Bharat Limited; Mr. Dharmendra Tuteja, CFO, Dalmia Bharat Limited, and the other management of the company. The earnings release has already been uploaded on the company's website. With this, I will now hand the conference over to Mr. Dalmia for opening remarks. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Good morning everyone. I will begin with an overview of our performance and then Dharmendra will provide a more detailed explanation of our operational and financial aspects. During the quarter, we have delivered a healthy volume growth and have regained our market share. If you recall, we had lost market share in the first half of the year. We undertook some corrective actions and subsequent volume recovery during the last two quarters makes us believe that the whole issue is now behind us. while we have regained market share the volume growth has come at a higher cost during the quarter the prices in our key markets declined and due to lower realizations and higher cost our ebitda per ton declined to 743 rupees per ton the price drop in q4 is far more than what we have seen in similar period in any previous year prices on an average declined by 7.5% qoq while exit prices in march were lower by 9 to 10% compared to q3 average generally q1 sees a price increase across the markets however we have not seen it so far i believe that the prices may remain soft in the first two quarters and price increase if any may happen from q3 this year onwards during q4 to regain market share we have incurred some incremental costs some of which some of which we believe would be corrected over the next few quarters dharmender will take you through the details in his opening remarks coming to the outlook for the sector i continue to believe in the india growth story and we believe that we will continue to see the gdp growth upward of 7% in the coming years since cement would play an important role in the india growth story led by all round infrastructure development housing and private capex i believe that the cement demand should grow between 8 and a half to 9% i believe that we can deliver a volume growth of 1 and a half times of the sector excluding sales from the jp assets the additional volume from jp should give us an incremental 4 to 5% growth on an overall basis during the year financial year 24 we have added 6 million tons of cement capacity and reached closing capacity of 44.6 million tons our 1 million ton expansion at both arialur and kadappa is under trial run production we have also added 0.9 million tons of clinker capacity in south during the year the jp transaction has taken longer than we anticipated but it is progressing in the right direction as you all must have read in the papers narsel has put in a bid to buy the entire debt of jp and it is under evaluation by the current lenders we understand that the lenders are keen to create lending capacity on their balance sheet by transferring this debt to narsel but there are procedural delays which are beyond our control 
and the transaction closure may get pushed out to Q2 of this year. We continue to establish our brand and distribution in MP and UP through the tolling arrangement with JP. In Q4, we sold 0.6 million tons from JP and in financial year 24, we sold 1.4 million tons through this tolling arrangement. Some questions were raised regarding our limestone reserves. We have already clarified that we have sufficient reserves and there have been some gaps in the information that resides in the public domain, which is in the process of getting corrected. For example, in case of our Murli plant, the updated records now show that our limestone reserves are up from three years to 22 years. We are very excited about the promise that this sector holds. We remain convinced about the structural trends that support secular demand growth, rising entry barriers, and further consolidation in the sector. While prices may remain under pressure, we will continue to invest in our brand, deepen our cost leadership, and focus on organization building. Now I will request Dharminder to take you through the detailed financial performance for the year and the quarter gone by. Thank you. Thank you, Puneji. Good morning, everyone. Let me take you through the key aspects of our performance. During the quarter, we delivered a healthy volume growth of 18.5% by OY and sold 8.8 .8 million tons. On a full year basis, our volume growth was 11.8% by OY and sales volume was 28.8 million tons. Our overall trade mix has improved to 65% during the year from 63% last year. Our revenues during the quarter increased by 10% by OY to rupees 4,000. 307 crores and full year by 8.4 percent YOY to rupees 14,691 crores. However, NSR declined 7.5 percent QQ to rupees 4,891 in Q4 as prices declined in our key operating markets. During the year, we launched a new brand campaign, RCF Strong to Ghar Strong, and repositioned Dalmia as Roof Column Foundation Expert. That is. RCF expert. We have invested about rupees 70 crores during the quarter in marketing, which is an increase of about rupees 30 crore on a QOQ basis. Our raw material costs during the quarter has increased by 4 percent YOY to rupees 771 per ton of cement production, with about 2 to 6 percent increase in slag and slash costs. If you add purchase of stock in trade goods under tolling arrangement with JP Group, the increase in the financials would appear much higher as our volumes from JP plants are increasing quarter upon quarter. Power and fuel cost declined 21 percent YOY to rupees 1018 per ton of cement, mainly due to 48 dollar decline in the fuel consumption cost on a YOY basis. With this, our blended fuel cost during the quarter stands at rupees 1.45 per kcal. Besides the correction fuel prices, our efficiency parameters like usage of renewable power improved to 27% from 21% in FI23. Bring about more predictability and sustainability in our costs. We will continue to invest in renewable power and operationalize our own coal mines during the year. During the quarter, in order to regain market share, we have incurred additional logistic costs and as a result of which, our logistic cost increased by 4.7 percent by OY to rupees 1,158 per ton. We believe that a large part of this increase would be corrected in the coming quarters. During the quarter, our finished WIP and stock in trade inventory declined by rupees 137 crores. This also led to increase in cost of goods sold by about rupees 40 per ton as the fixed overheads which are inventorized came as a charge to P&L. This will reverse in coming two quarters when inventory levels rise and on a full year basis such effects get neutralized with most of the charge coming in Q4. Other expenses like sales commission, depot related expenses coupled with increase in repair costs Material handling and packing expenses have increased by rupees 92 crores on a YOI basis due to higher volumes. Overall, our EBITDA during the quarter declined by 
7.8% YOY to Rs. 654 crores, which translates to an EBITDA of Rs. 743 per ton. On a full year basis, EBITDA increased by 13.4% YOY to Rs. 2639 crores with Rs. 917 per ton of EBITDA. On incentives, we accrued Rs. 93 crores during the year or during the quarter and collected Rs. 98 crores. On a full year basis, our accrual and collections are also largely the same. Accruals were about Rs. 298 crores, while collection has been 314 crores, with closing outstanding of Rs. 701 crores. For financial year 25, we expect the total incentive accruals to be around 300 crores. The other income during the quarter has increased by Rs. 82 crores on YOA basis to Rs. 120 crores, primarily due to higher treasury income coupled with increase in dividend income by Rs. 14 crores, receipt of interest subvention incentive income of Rs. 22 crores, about Rs. 11 crores interest on income tax refunds for earlier years, and the realization of insurance claims of Rs. 9 crores. During the quarter, we have reviewed our accounting policies and practices with leading industry players and made changes in few of these to align with industry practices. Due to this, certain line items in the reported financials for previous year has also been restated. While we have made the appropriate disclosures in the results released yesterday, let me briefly take you through these changes. First is, we have re-evaluated the economic benefits derived from property, plant and equipment of our northeast units and decided to change the method of providing depreciation on PPE from written down value method to straight line method, with effect from 1st January 2024. Now we are providing depreciation on SLM method across the company. Further, we have also reassessed the salvage value of the building and other plant and equipments from 1% to 5% of the cost, with effect from 1st January 2024. Consequent to both these changes, the depreciation during the quarter was lower by Rs. 46 crores and Rs. 14 crores respectively. Secondly, the classification of unwinding of income on interest-free loan from state government has now been reclassified to other operating income from other income. Consequently, our revenue from operations has now been restated. The impact of reclassification is included in our financial reports. The with above changes, the depreciation during the quarter declined by Rs. 8 crores on a YOY basis. However, it has increased by Rs. 193 crores for financial year 24 when compared to financial year 23. Of this increase, Rs. 108 crore pertains to components of plant and equipment which were and are being replaced as part of our overall debottling project. We expect depreciation to be in the range of 1350 to 1400 crores in FY25, excluding the impact of JP plant depreciation. Our profit after tax for the company stands at Rs. 853 crores in the year against Rs. 1079 crores in FI23. If you recall, we had a gain of Rs. 554 crores in share of profit in associate, Rs. 125 crores tax thereon, and Rs. 144 crore loss in exception items last year, which was primarily due to the recognition of sale of our refractory business. Same is not there in the current year or current quarter. <coughs> Our planned capacity expansion at Kadapa in the Arialur for 1 million ton each is under trial run and will be commissioned in the current quarter. <coughs> Sorry. We are also progressing well on 0 0.5 million ton uh, expansion in Rotas and 2.4 million ton in Lanka, northeast, which is expected to come uh, on stream by end of FI25. Considering all organic and the proposed JP acquisition, we are likely to close this year at 58.9 million tons of cement capacity. The capital expenditure during the full year FY24 was Rs. 2,827 crores against our expectations of 3,000 crores. We expect capex spending of about 3,500 to 4,000 crores of capex in FY25, which will largely include spends towards Northeast expansion project, Rota cement plant in uh, Bihar, and also certain ROI and maintenance capexes. This will be besides the <coughs> outflow of uh, for JP assets, which is expected to be around 3,500 crores for 5.2 million tons, 
cement capacity of Reva, Chur, Chunar and Sadwa and 2.2 million tons for JPS sale assets. With this capex, we expect our peak gross debt to be about 9,000 crore and net debt of about 5,000 to 5,250 crore by year end. As of 31st March, our gross debt has increased by uh, 887 crore and the closing debt stood at rupees 4,651 crore. At the same time, our net debt declined to rupees 484 crore, resulting in a net debt to a bit of 0.18 times as of 31st March. Lastly, in in line with the capital allocation framework, the board has proposed a final dividend of Rs. 5 per share, which is subject to the approval of the shareholders in the ensuing AGM. This is in addition to the interim dividend of Rs. 4 per share. The total dividend declared for the year, including interim, is Rs. 9 per share. With this, I now open the floor for question and answers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask questions may press star and 1 on their touchstone phone. If you wish to withdraw yourself from the question queue, you may press star and 2. Participants are requested to use only handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Ritesh Shah from Investec. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, uh, sir. Am I audible? Yes, yes, yes please. Yeah. Uh, sir, I had two questions. Uh, first was on JP. Uh, how much money did we make on a certain basis on the tolling that we did? 0.6 million tons for the quarter and for the fiscal. Uh, that's one bookkeeping. And uh, second question is uh, would it be possible for you to actually bifurcate the entire 9.4 million tons? So we understand that 5.2 million ton part of the kitty is uh, pretty much clear. Uh, so how should we look at it? So you indicated Dreva, Chunar, Chiruk is one. Uh, then there's a Belai uh, facility which is there. So what is the sort of clarity that we have on this particular asset, uh, again, when it comes to procurement of the clinker? Uh, likewise on Negri and lastly on uh, Superbella. So, if you could please provide some clarity from a legal aspect as well as the process. Uh, I understand timelines could be tough, but would be interested to know the process, sir. Uh, so, uh, I think uh, on the Reva uh, package, we have already said that, uh, you know, this requires a NOC from the banks. The banks are, uh, you know, we understand that they are trying to sell their loan to Narsil so that we don't have to deal with 35 banks to get an NOC, but it is only from one one person who holds the loan. I think this process has uh, uh, is uh, undergoing and progressing quite well, uh, although there are some procedural delays, and we expect that uh, this should get, uh, you know, consummated in the second quarter of this year. Uh, as regards the sale package, uh, you know, this requires... Uh, uh, you know, sale to take a view as to whether they want to, they are a joint venture partner, whether they want to buy, hold or sell. So they have a right of first refusal, uh, you know, and um, so either they can buy the shares or they can sell the shares to us or they can continue to remain a joint venture partner. So I think uh, sale is still evaluating the proposal and um, I think again, you know, once uh, sale has evaluated the proposal, they will come back to us. I think this is uh, the legal process in both uh, in both the uh, packages. Uh, let me see, you want to add anything? Uh, the capacity breakup, this 5.2 million is one consortium transaction, Reva, Chur, Chunar, Sadhva. So all of this comes together. And the second uh, separate transaction is Negri plus uh, BJCL, which has 4.2 million of uh, cement and 1.1 million of clean car. <coughs> Right. Uh, so you, uh, thank you. Thank you for your answer. So you uh, indicated that the lenders, we need an NOC over there. Uh, who's the lead indicator or who's the lead banker over here? Uh, have the banks already approved it or the consortium still needs to approve the bid? Uh, and is there scope or some probability for a re-auction over here or uh, should we assume that we should rule it out? I think, uh, you know, until the company goes into NCLT, uh, there is no, uh, you know, banks are not driving the process. 
this uh, sale process is being driven by the JP board and the JP shareholders have to approve it. And uh, the JP shareholders have already approved the transaction, board has already approved the transaction. Uh, we already have CCI approval for the transaction and all we need is the bank's NOC because the company is in default of the loans. You know. Okay. Uh, lastly, uh, JP uh, profitability on, on the tolling volumes? So on profitability, we would not like to share uh, currently. The, we don't share regional breakup of profitability. No worries. Thank you so much, sir. I'll join back with you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. The next question is from the line of Rajesh Kumar Ravi from HDFC Securities. Please go ahead. Hi, sir. Good morning. Uh, my first question is on the uh, uh, this Super Gala. What is the status on the same? And then a uh, few housekeeping questions vis a -vis trade, non trade, and uh, you know, the other blended cement and all which I'll come back. So, uh, as we've said earlier, also, Super Dollar, the JP is in arbitration with Ultratech, and I think our transaction is subject to the outcome of that arbitration. So, that arbitration is going on right now, and um, you know, till we know the outcome of that arbitration, I think uh, you know, this deal cannot be done uh, till the arbitration is concluded. Okay, and this 3500 crore which you are, uh, you know, targeting for the acquisition, that is only for the uh, phase one acquisition or that includes even the 4.2 million ton? It includes uh, BGCL sale also and uh, Nigri will be on the long term lease. Okay, okay. And coming uh, coming to this housekeeping question, what was the blended cement uh, trade share and uh, trade share and premium share in this quarter? The trade sales was 65% for this quarter, premium products was 21% and the blended sale for this uh, period is 86.7, 87%. And sir, uh, green power share and fuel mix? Uh, the green power for this quarter is uh, 28% and fuel mix uh, um, Petcoke is about 56 percent. Beyond that, uh, we normally don't share. And CC ratio? CC ratio for the quarter is 1.67. Okay. Sir, one last question. In this quarter, we have seen very strong volumes, but the margins have taken a significant beating. So what is the outlook in terms of these margins? Whenever we see uh, like you uh, targeting 1.5x industry growth, so, will that growth come at a significant lower margins or a thousand rupee or EBITDA margin which the company has historically delivered? That is not a, you know, a pipe dream or a distant dream for the uh, place like you and for the industry in general. Will we, uh, would, should we be factoring decent margins when we are targeting, uh, you know, uh, strong volumes? So basically, as you also heard from Paniji and in my opening remarks, that uh, this additional cost also entails some of the incremental costs on the logistic, on the branding, and some of these other things. So a couple of these things will definitely be reversible. They'll get uh, uh, they'll get uh, neutralized or corrected in the next couple of quarters. So we expect this margins uh, recovery to happen. But of course, the selling prices also play an important part, which we expect that in the first two quarters they may remain soft. And uh, once third or fourth quarter, then the prices improve, definitely the profitability margins will be in healthier. Okay. Great, sir. Thank you. I'll come back in queue. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Satyadeep Jain from Ambit Capital. Please go ahead. Hi. Thank you. Um, this first one, the depreciation, changing depreciation policy, I know back about four or five years ago, uh, the company had changed the depreciation policy to WDV for Northeast asset. So what is leading to all these changes? What was the rationale back at that time to change to WDV, um, given you were an outlier at that time? Yes, sir, if you are right. Uh, the earlier change when we did, at that time, we had benchmarked the Northeast uh, plants to the Northeastern players, like Star and other players in Northeast. Most of them uh, do a WDV method of uh, depreciation. But currently now when we have realigned it, we have realigned to the uh, national players, or leading players. Most of them, they have uh, SLM method. So the entire company now we have moved to the SLM method. 
Okay. Uh, just on um, the other expenses you mentioned about, uh, 30 crore is reversible. Is that right from the current quarter? Because other expenses did increase. No, no. When I said, no, no. When I said the 30 crore has increased, so and we also continue to focus on our branding and uh, activities. So this 30 crore may not reverse uh, soon. In the current year, the focus on branding will remain. But the other things which I said, uh, the inventory depletion had an impact of about rupees 40 per ton over it's getting charged off. That is uh, uh, reversible because first two quarters inventory builds up and rather there will be negative uh, charge of its assets, assets over it's. And uh, the increase in cost on account of uh, uh, logistic or depot expenses or sales commission, etc., which went up uh, in the quarter four, these will normalize in the coming quarters. And also, uh, there's one more thing. Uh, the logistic cost also is, uh, is going to normalize. So these things will happen, uh, which will be taking it to normal positions. Okay, fair. So just one clarification. I just one question on um, the timeline for uh, the medium term capacity expansion that you had outlined. When are you thinking of uh, putting it up? We are still debating that within our management team and our board. Uh, I think we will take a few more quarters before we can come back to you with a you know plan for the further expansion. Okay. Thank okay. you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Nikunj Man Mandovara from UBS Securities. Please go ahead. Hey, hi, hi. Thanks for the opportunity. So I just wanted to get more color on how do we see the volume growth year over year for the next year, and we are seeing 8.5 to 9 percent. But how do we see this playing out uh, quarter wise? Because I expect H2 will have to do the heavy lifting in the volume growth year. And so, secondly, related to this, what is giving us confidence that pricing should bounce back in H2? Because if I look, I think there is lots of uh, capacity, fresh capacity which is going to come in in H2. We, uh, we by Ultratech, by Shri, and even uh, if the DP acquisition is completed, then even for us. So, so what is giving us confidence that pricing should uh, bounce back in H2? Thanks. No, I think uh, nobody can forecast, uh, you know, prices. All I said was that uh, I don't see any uh, strong momentum in the market right now. And if at all, you know, the, uh, you know, price is correct, they will correct in H2 because first quarter is the election year. The first quarter is election, second quarter is monsoons. And if at all there's some recovery, it's likely to happen post the monsoon quarter and the election quarter. Okay, okay, sir. Thank you. And sir, on the volume growth question? So I think we have said that, uh, you know, we think we can... Uh, grow at one and a half times the industry and JP assets can further add four to five percentage points in terms of volume growth. So I think uh, it's hard for us to give quarter by quarter forecast on, uh, you know, volumes, but I think we are giving a general guidance on, you know, how we, we think we can grow on a, you know, sustainable basis. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Indrajit Agarwal from CLSA. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you for the opportunity. Sir, I have a question which is more on a strategy or medium term viewpoint, not just on this quarter. So what role does operating leverage play in our business? We understand the fixed cost, variable cost is one part, which is maybe par and fuel freight, etc. But even after such strong volume growth, we have not really seen the benefits of operating leverage in the last few quarters. So going ahead, Oh, where do we think we can really beat the street on cost particularly, not on volume growth, but on fixed cost recovery? See, the fixed costs uh, have been created for a much larger uh, capacity in the coming years. So when we envisaged uh, that we'll be growing uh, capacity to about, let's say, 75 million tons, but anyway, so even a medium-term plan for the next year is about, let's say, close to 48, 49. So the Costs have largely been created, and now I think as we improve the capacity utilizations, so this operating leverage will definitely come into picture. So going ahead, are we having, sorry, sorry, are we having said that, I think we will invest uh, some amount of it into brand building. Uh, you know, so part of it will be, it will come as an expense on our P&L, but, you know, we think it's a long-term investment, and it will help us, uh, uh, you know, in the longer run with the, uh, you know, better margins. So I think uh, 
some of it will show up as operating leverage as fixed cost gets amortized over a higher volume uh, as we utilize our capacity. Uh, but part of that we will reinvest back into building our brand. When you say brand building, it is, is it more of advertisement or more of dealer incentive and dealer discounting? How should we look at it? So it is mainly the brand as well as the uh, activities which you do around the dealer shops, um, marketing activities, technical services activities, customer relationship management activities, not the discounts. Because discounts, uh, because once the marketing spend and brand strength improves, discounts will go down. You don't require discounts to push up your sales volume. So that is the idea that there should be demand pull through brand, higher, better strength of the uh, brand rather than need to push sales through discounts. Route. Thank you. And my last question is on power and fuel. Any further reduction expected in the sense what is the spot cost versus what we have booked in fourth quarter? So basically, uh, the next quarter you can expect um, another reduction about 1-2% uh, because Petco prices have largely stabilized in the last couple of months and the first quarter uh, rates are already contracted. So you can expect about 2% uh, drop from the current uh, quarter level. Sure. Thank you for your answer. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The next question is from the line of Sumangal Nevatia from Kotex Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, good morning and thank you for the uh, chance. Uh, first question is, is it possible to give the breakup of JPA and uh, organic volumes in fourth quarter uh, and want to understand basically on a year-on-year -year basis how much uh, uh, X of JPA has the volume grown? So out of 8.8 .8 million total sales, <clears throat> 0.6 is on account of JP and the rest is on account of uh, our existing uh, plants volumes. So to X of JP, I think the growth is about 12%. Okay, and last year, fourth quarter, it was what, 0.1 or something, uh, JP volumes? That was, yeah, 0.1. 2.21, okay, got it, got it. Point, no, point 0.1. Point. Yeah, point one. Last year was, this quarter was uh, about 90,000 or so. Okay, got that, got that. Uh, I mean, uh, just from a strategy point of view, I mean, if you look at FY24, few quarters we've lost volumes. Now we've regained volumes at the cost of margins, uh, which is not, I mean, this kind of a volatility in performance is not there with peers, right? So, I mean, from an FY25 point of view, how should we look? I mean, for the management, what is the priority? Is it earnings? Is it market share volumes or um, or margins? Uh, some some uh, thought process if you could share. Now, trust on the market uh, share regaining will continue, but of course, uh, it will, as I said, uh, the cost which got increased in Q4 will get normalized. So the quality of sales also will improve, but definitely the volume improvement will remain the number one priority. Okay, okay. And I mean, directionally, is it possible to share, I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, the contribution from tolling, I mean, is it a negative contribution and just to, I mean, uh, penetrate new markets, are we doing the sacrifice till, till we get these acu uh, assets under our umbrella? I mean, just directionally, is it possible to share how, how the margin for contribution is comparing versus organic volumes? The current uh, will not have to share the separate uh, profitability of JP operations, but uh, you can expect that we'll bring these plants to our normal cost structure of Dalmia in about two years. So in the third year, we, we can expect similar profitability as we get in the rest of the group. And for two years to gradually improve <coughs> the profitability. Okay, got it. And just one last thing on the prices in the opening remarks, did we confirm that uh, we've not seen any price increase in East and South in our core markets in the month of April because there are a lot of reports suggesting an attempt of a big hike. But can you just share what's been uh, the on-ground on on situation in the last few weeks? Yes, uh, in the April month also we have not seen any improvement. So we are close to the exit levels of March, which is about 9 to 10% lower than the Q3 levels. Okay, and what would be this exit level versus 4Q average? And about uh, Q4, uh, compared to Q4 average, it will be about 2% lower. 2% lower. Exit okay. levels. Exit. Got it. All right. Thank you and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. 
We'll take the next question from the line of Pulkit Patni from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Um, so thank you for taking my questions. Uh, most answered. One question, I mean, you yourself said in your opening remarks that this is unprecedented in terms of the price action that you have seen. Um, could you highlight why uh, these kind of price correction happen? Is it just because in a pre-election period everybody wanted to get to volumes, which is why price wasn't a consideration? And if you could also get a sense of why this should change, given everybody is adding capacity, because uh, you know it's it's pretty pretty worrisome in terms of the way price action had happened in the sector in this quarter. I think uh, you know as I said, it is hard to forecast prices in a commodity business. Uh, and uh, uh, we personally think that in the next two quarters, this is an election quarter, and the next quarter is a monsoon quarter. So, you know, I think uh, it will be hard for us to believe that there will be a significant upswing in prices. Uh, although I think there will be, uh, everybody will, uh, you know, report some margin drop, how much, etc., needs to be watched. So. Uh, it's hard to hard to predict by when and how much prices will rise and um, uh, while capacity addition continues i think the rate of capacity addition is lower than the uh, rate of demand growth so utilization levels should go up gradually uh, i think that is what we are seeing however the, there is excess capacity in the industry that's a reality and uh, uh, you know as long as uh, there is new capacity addition and there is a a quest for higher growth, prices could be under pressure. Uh, having said this, you know, we have seen this industry, it goes through, you know, ups and downs in terms of margins. Uh, we still believe that, uh, you know, there is a structural trend of, uh, you know, higher consolidation and there is a, uh, you know, there are rising entry barriers. So even if, let us say, margins are under pressure, it may enhance and accelerate consolidation as well. So. I think it's hard to forecast uh, prices on a quarter on quarter basis but uh, you know all I can say is that you know we remain convinced about our investment thesis in this sector and uh, rising consolidation is a trend that we continue to see we are already seeing three transactions which are in in the works ultratech is buying kesoram uh, ambuja is buying sangi and our transaction with gap is under process these three are large transactions there are some small transactions which were announced recently in terms of grinding units, uh, which were bought by, um, you know, Ultratech and Ambuja. Ambuja bought My Home Cement grinding unit in Tamil Nadu, and Ultratech bought uh, the Parley Cement unit of uh, India Cement in Maharashtra. So I think uh, the trend for consolidation will continue, and um, uh, over a medium term, margin should normalize, in my view. If sure, sure. We are hoping for the same, sir. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take the next question from the line of Mohit Jain from Tara Capital Partners. Please go ahead. Hello. Yeah. Sir, so so uh, so it's not that clear. May I request yeah, you to kindly use your handset, please? Yes, I uh, can you hear Yes, sir. Please proceed. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to have a, uh, uh, a view on the expansion plan. You said that the board is looking into it and maybe a couple of quarters will come with it. Uh, so have you said that, is it uh, likely that the, the 75 million tons uh, target of uh, FY27 is likely to push back because I think the, the order has to start soon if we want to achieve that timeline. Right? So how do you look at that? Sir? I think, uh, you know, we will comment on this uh, over the next few quarters. As I said, we are, you know, we are working on it uh, with the management and with the board. And I think, uh, you know, we will we will share with you whenever we are ready. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We'll take the next question from the line of Rahul Gupta from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Yeah, hello. 
Yes, sir, please proceed. No, thank you for taking my question. Uh, I'm sorry to ask a similar question like other participants, but in a different way. Uh, so this question is for Puneet. Uh, Puneet, you uh, you have been bullish on medium-term India story for some time, and um, hence uh, and demand for cement will remain strong over medium to longer term, right? Uh, but given seasonally, uh, next couple of quarters is going to be weak for the industry. Uh, what is the risk of demand not improving in second half? or uh, getting pushed out to next year. Um, that's it. Thank you. Look, it's hard for me to forecast demand on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis. But, uh, you know, I think if GDP growth continues at, you know, seven, six and a half, seven percent 7%, we think that this is a, a, you know, phase of India where it is uh, uh, infrastructure-led growth. And the cement demand is likely to be uh, you know, 1.2, 1.25 times GDP growth. So if GDP growth gets, you know, hit on account of geopolitical factors, which as of now it seems that India is reasonably insulated, uh, you know, other than that, I don't think that the structural demand story is under pressure in any way. But uh, quarter on quarter, sometimes things, you know, uh, get pushed out. But we've seen that even if there is one year of lower demand growth next year, it catches up. Projects sometimes get pushed on the ground for a few quarters, but, uh, you know, they don't get completely abandoned. So I think it's hard for me to forecast uh, quarter on quarter, and I think it's, uh, uh, you know, the, the structural demand story is, uh, you know, quite strong. But uh, if there is any shock on, you know, macro global shock on which impacts GDP growth, then I think, uh, you know, it may impact cement demand as well. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Naveen Sahadev from ICICI Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Please proceed. Uh, right. So, thank you for the opportunity. Puneeti, uh, just in the previous uh, uh, question comment, uh, you mentioned that there is consolidation on the rise. Uh, more recently, there have been a couple of grinding units, especially let's look at, let's say, uh, my home who sold a Tuticorin unit. Uh, while consolidation is definitely uh, a good thing, but would we should, should not want look at it this way that uh, these promoters uh, look at uh, like, you know, prices being bad in these markets for a slightly more prolonged period of time, and hence they are giving up on these assets rather than keep incurring losses or you know, uh, or not really operating these utilized or, or units to the fullest. So is that not an indication of a prolonged price weakness also when these companies are looking at uh, sales of grinding units? I think, uh, you know, they they still have all their assets in these markets. So if it was a decision which was driven by a prolonged price, you know, a view of prolonged price pain and, you know, uh, structurally lower margins, then, you know, they should in divest more assets rather than, you know, a few assets. Because, you know, all their assets are in these markets only. So I think it is more driven by, it is more driven by some maybe, you know, need to uh, improve the balance sheet strength uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, a long-term uh, view of structural weakness in the market. Uh, helpful. Uh, so, second question was on the non-trade segment, both for us and the industry. So, uh, is it safe to say that at Dalmia in March quarter, our exposure towards non-trade would have gone up and hence a slightly more amplified impact on realizations? That's just one part of the question. The second is in the same breath. Uh, at a broader industry level, do you see demand in general tilting or shifting towards non-trade segment, and hence industries or company as a, I mean, industry as a whole and companies are uh, increasing their exposure towards non-trade, where the price gap I think has gone up materially. Thank you. So in the last quarter, our non-trade sales has gone down. In fact, the trade percentage has gone from 63 to 65. So that means that there's a 2% drop in the non-trade sales. However, uh, our focus continues to be to build a good brand and also to gain further uh, improvement in the trade share. 
but definitely non trade being a uh, significant portion of the total market that cannot be neglected so gradually we'll keep improving the uh, trade but also keep using the non trade segment for our utilization of our capacities and in some of the markets as you rightly said the prices have improved so cost prices and profitability is similar as we are in the trade segment that's great just just that uh, at a broader industry level uh, some color or some thoughts if the exposure to non trade i mean while it's great to know that in a quarter like march when everybody was fo- focusing on volumes dalmi had a commendable job of trade going up in fact from 63 to 65 but at a industry level are you seeing some change that non trade as a segment is is uh, getting uh, more share now overall of course since the uh, demand in the uh, urban areas or the rmc sector is leading to a slight increase in the non trade segment including the infra spending of the government however all the big players i think they continue to focus on their brand strength and also on the trade segment but there are some other players which cater to the non trade segment so their share in the non trade may be going up but overall industry level yes uh, uh, the non trade segment continues to be strong Thank you, sir. We'll take the next question from the line of Jashan Deep Singh Chadha from Nomura. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I hope I am audible. Yes, sir. You are audible. Yeah. Uh, so coming to you know Dalmi, firstly I would like to understand, given that this quarter your volume growth from the core assets has been around 11 to 12 percent. So is South accounting for the uh, you know majority of the growth? And if yes, how much market share gain uh, you would have in South? And also for a couple of quarters now we are seeing that whatever the reduction or the increase in realization has been there, the EBITDA pattern follows that. So there is no question from the you know cost saving. So is it uh, you know safe to say that Dagnia has reached its lowest cost? And if not, you know what is the delta you see for the next coming year? And from where uh, you know these cost savings will be coming? This is my first question. say we don't give the regional break up of the market shares or the uh, profitability etc so that i not like to comment but uh, uh, we have not reached the lowest level of the cost what we plan we are amongst the lowest cost players in the industry but there is further room to improve the cost in terms of uh, the uh, re power will continue to increase the coal mines which will be starting uh, uh, in the current year that will bring down our costs then of course there'll be a lot of ROI projects and logistic cost we see a lot of room to improve uh, in terms of cost both in terms of lead distance as well as the uh, right mix of the usage of the rail and the road so uh, sequentially directionally the cost will continue to drive and we continue to aim to be the lowest cost producer in the industry just thank you for this sir uh, just to follow up on this if you can directionally you know uh, provide us that was south doing better than east just a directional thing and second on cost uh, i see you know you have earlier planned to have 130 million ton uh, 130 megawatt of solar but you ended up just at 113 megawatt if i'm not wrong this quarter uh, so what was the uh, you know what was the reason for the delay and second uh, what uh, what was the lead distance for this quarter because your uh, logistical cost of you were saying has increased so how much sequentially the uh, you know your lead distance has increased so lead distance for the current quarter is 289 which is increase of 2 km from the last quarter and uh, uh, directionally would not like to comment on the regional profitability and in terms of the re power see the delay was when we are noticing uh, the negotiations of this um, uh, re power projects uh, we saw that technological changes are also coming to play and that was driving the cost down so instead of contracting earlier rather we waited and ultimately whatever orders we have finalized they are much much lower compared to what we would have contracted earlier so maybe there was a saving of about 60 paisa per unit kind of thing had we contracted it 6 months earlier so currently we are at around 185 megawatt re power capacity we expect that by the end of the fy25 we'll be touching about 350 or so and again go up significantly in the fy26 for which we'll give you set uh, volumes for exact capacities in subsequent quarters 
Okay, thank you, sir. And uh, my next question is on JP. So we have seen, you know, historically, whenever a company is under NPA and uh, an asset construction company overtake that, so normally that overrides any management decision. So in light of that, how confident you are that the binding agreement that you have signed with the management will stay? And also, even if it stays, you have not, if I'm not wrong, you have not signed binding agreement for the complete 9.2 million ton. So once NARCL comes in the picture, how many? How confident you are of acquiring complete asset because this will also your your peers to you know make uh, bids for the remaining asset. See, uh, lenders assume control of the company when the matter is referred to NCLT, not under the normal uh, transfer of the debt to uh, NARCL. Because NARCL remains as a lender compared to let's say the current set of 35 lenders. So management controls and decision making remains with the company and its board. So that doesn't change. And in terms of the binding agreements, uh, the binding agreements are already signed for um, uh, this 5.2 million capacity of Reva Churchunar plus this 2.2 million of uh, BGCL, uh, which is sale JV. And the understanding is clear for the 2 million also that it will be on a uh, seven years lease. And within that period, we can always um, buy. And this is, of course, linked to the BGCL. So as, as and when we get this uh, closure, that can be signed immediately and implemented. That is not stuck for any other reason. I just want to add to this that the JP board and the shareholders have already approved the transaction. There is a binding agreement for that. Thank you for the explanation, sir. I'll join that with you. Thank you. We'll take the next question from the line of Darshan Mehta from Access Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, sir. Uh, sir, thanks for taking my question. Uh, sir, uh, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm repeating, but uh, so, uh, since you alluded to the fact that we have elections on the corner and hence it would be difficult for us to take prize in this. But uh, so, is this, uh, if, got, uh, if we see the last general election, I'm talking about April to May 19, while the uh, industry volumes were, were muted, it was able to take fair amount of prize in this. So, what is it that is different this time. And my second question is, uh, while you say that we have not seen any price increase in April, is it for uh, Dalmia or we, we can say the industry itself has not seen any price increase in April, uh, especially in South and East? Yeah, that is... I think the price decline is not just for Dalmia, but it is for the whole industry. Uh, and... Um, as regards, uh, you know, whether price increases can happen in, in the election quarter, uh, the answer is that yes, it can happen. However, I think uh, given the momentum that we are seeing in April, we feel that, uh, you know, the price increases are unlikely to come through this quarter. That's what we feel. But again, you know, who knows? Hard to forecast, uh, you know, how things will behave. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. We'll take the next question from the line of Rashi Chopra from Citigroup. Please go ahead. Thank you. Just uh, on the margins, in the last call, you had indicated that, you know, the EBITDA per ton for the next year or so should stabilize at about 11 to 12 million. And given where, you know, what has come through in the fourth quarter and given where prices are, that looks a little bit sort of stretched at this point. And Puneet, you also indicated that margins should stabilize in a few quarters or so in the medium term. So when we are talking about stabilizing and we are talking about the near term, um, are you suggesting that 11, 1200 is no longer the normal and it should likely be uh, lower? That's my first question. No, I think, uh, you know, as I said that, uh, you know, the uh, there has been an unprecedented price drop uh, during this quarter. Um, and I think um, uh, it is for the whole industry. Uh, as far as Dalmia is concerned, there were some uh, incremental costs that we incurred this quarter uh, in our quest to gain market share. Uh, some of those costs are going to get corrected. They are one-offs uh, and they will get corrected over the next few quarters. Um, uh, and uh, some of them will continue because we will invest in marketing and building our brand. Uh, but having said that, I think, uh, uh, you know, there will be price volatility and if uh, 
uh, if the uh, you know prices remain subdued uh, you know the margins can then only come from you know cost control uh, you know so i think uh, our focus will continue to tighten costs further uh, our our focus will be to you know invest in our brand and invest in uh, distribution and um, improve our utilization and gain market share uh, but as far as the overall pricing environment goes we will we will swing with the industry and i think as our brand gets stronger as our uh, uh, you know uh, distribution gets stronger in in the new markets that we are entering uh, i think we should be able to uh, reposition uh, dalmia in some markets where we are weak in terms of our pricing compared to our uh, competitors and uh, even if uh, price goes down part of that can be hedged by uh, you know improving our brand mix and improving our price positioning in some markets okay thanks are you able to quantify the one off costs in this quarter as in like what kind of a reversal can we see going forward yeah as uh, rashi has explained earlier in the call that uh, this inventory depletion in the current uh, quarter which was 137 crores so this embeds the fixed overheads which also get charged off so that should uh, when this gets uh, normalized it's an improvement of 40 rupees and the first or second to quarter rather when the inventory gets built it will be uh, saving in the fixed cost portion besides that the increase in the logistic cost we expect that this is going to be uh, normalized in the next uh, two or three quarter itself and uh, fixed cost overheads increase in terms of the marketing will continue we will continue to spend and the other expenses like uh, commission or um, uh, depot expenses also there also i think we expect some savings will come in the coming quarters and as we ramp up the jp operations there also we should improve got it so um, okay and so the logistics cost quantum would be how much for 70 rupees increase in the uh, current quarter so that the whole thing you're saying should majority of this okay okay uh, another point point was i think you mentioned that you know as the marketing spend increase the idea is essentially to build brand and that's how the volume push happens and dealer discounts don't really need to be high uh was that the same situation in this quarter i e that you know the kind of realization pain that you have seen that should be felt by competition as well or you know or did you have to kind of increase the discounts to be able to get these volumes over the year we have been able to reduce the discounts marginally but we see more scope as we spend more on the branding uh, we see more scope to reduce the discounts and i think overall the the realization of uh, competitors will depend on their market mix and their brand mix and their trade segment uh, trade and non trade mix as well so i think let's see uh, we are the first ones to declare results i think over the next uh, 30 days we should get more more visibility on this got it thank you just one last housekeeping question what was your consumption cost of fuel on a per kcal basis yeah 1 rupees 45 paisa thank you thank you the next question is from the line of aman agrawal from equirus securities please go ahead yes sir thank you for the opportunity so i just wanted to understand on the uh, captive coal mine that you have mentioned uh, uh, in the presentation so what kind of output are you looking out of this and uh, maybe what kind of a uh, uh, share would be uh, would this mine be able to meet of our overall coal requirement and the cost uh, uh, that you expect uh, uh, per kcal maybe if you can share such details if yeah, the specifics i will not be able to share but uh, it is uh, the jharkhand mine bidda sasai which we had got so that will get operationalized in the current year and the next year in mandla coal block also will get operationalized mandla will not come into operations this year so this bidda sasai will cater to uh, part of our requirement in the east and will definitely uh, bring down the cost uh, significantly but exact specifics i would not like to share right now and it's just and it's and uh, just lastly if you can uh, uh, Sorry for the repetition, but if you can share the peak debt numbers and uh, uh, maybe the expected depreciation number that you shared earlier. Yes, please. The so depreciation we expect to be about thirteen fifty to fourteen hundred crores for the coming year. Uh, this is uh, without JP assets, and uh, peak debt to be about uh, around nine thousand crores, and net debt around five thousand crores or so by end of the year. Thank you. Thank you for the answers. Thank you. 
We'll take the next question from the line of Ashish Jain from Macquarie. Please go ahead. Hi, sir. Good morning. Uh, sir, I had a couple of, uh, you know, uh, basic questions. Like on tolling, when we send the clinker, uh, that is not recorded as a sale in our case. Uh, is that right? Or we are recording both clinker and cement sale uh, as volume? The only when cement is purchased by us from JP, it is recorded as a purchase of uh, stock and trade. And when it is sold, it is uh, coming in the sales. So movement of clinker from Reva to Chunar, uh, it is within the JP system. So that is not cognized as purchase by us. Okay, okay, got it. So secondly, the, the freight cost increase that you spoke about quarter on quarter, can you give some more color on that? Like was it a, a factor of regional mix or... What was the main reason for that? Yeah, multiple uh, multiple factors are there, including the movement of the clinker, uh, from increase in the two two kilometer increase in the lead distance, some PTPK increases. Many of these things will know. And regional mix also is important in this. Okay, okay. And lastly, you know, this question is uh, is for Puneet. Uh, so Puneet, you know, in the last say three four years. We have, you know, spoken a lot about uh, growth and a certain long-term number, but in terms of execution, you know, we have clearly been uh, behind the curve. Like we also expected JPA to come through much sooner. Now it has uh, seen delayed, and uh, you know, September also I guess is more a hope at this moment rather than a, a you know high conviction timeline. And, you know, even on the uh, uh, organic expansion now, like you highlighted earlier in the call that we are revisiting at a board level. So what has really changed? Because we were clearly very aggressive in terms of our long-term volume targets and all. And now there seems to be a lot of two and, you know, uh, two step forward, one step backward kind of thing. So what has really changed in our thought process or is it something else, you know, which we should be aware of? I think the long-term story is still intact. Uh, I think there have been, uh, you know, some delays in the JP acquisition, uh, for sure. And uh, I personally also think that uh, uh, I still remain convinced that it is progressing in the right direction. I think no question about the fact that, uh, you know, we we were quite confident uh, in the last call that the transaction should get consummated before March, uh, but it didn't happen. So there is a procedural delay. And uh, I think, uh, you know, whenever do you do an acquisition, uh, like this, uh, you know, it is uh, uh, the company is under stress from uh, on a def because it is defaulted. So it sometimes takes longer than than you expect. But it is also giving us time to establish ourselves in the region. Uh, so there is a uh, there is a lead time that we get uh, to to uh, establish distribution, brand, and volume in in that region. Uh, so I would say that. Uh, yes, some of the things, uh, you know, don't pan out as you expect, but that's a part of life. And um, I think overall, we are quite happy that, uh, you know, we have grown to, uh, you know, 50 million tons or uh, close to 50 million tons without uh, adding any debt on our balance sheet. I think that's a, you know, very impressive achievement in the last, uh, you know, three, three and a half years. We've doubled our capacity without adding, uh, you know, debt on our balance sheet. Uh, there has been, uh, you know, some up and down with respect to, uh, you know, our volume uh, growth and our market share. Uh, but I think uh, we did try some experiments which didn't work. We have learned very quickly. Uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, you know, demonstrated our ability to regain market share, uh, you know, in, in two quarters itself. And uh, I think, uh, you know, the cost is not fully optimized yet, and that's okay. We will optimize costs as we go along in the coming year. And um, uh, I think uh, we just want to make sure that... Uh, you know, we uh, think through our next phase of expansion and, and uh, you know, announce it when we are ready. And as I said, I mean, I, I, I remain highly convinced about the fact that there will be more consolidation, entry barriers are riding and demand, rising and demand growth, uh, you know, will continue in the sector. Actually, you know, so in a long-term story, in a long-term story, couple of quarters here, there makes, uh, you know, is something that we have to be prepared for and we you know, we can adjust for. But I think overall, uh, in terms of capacity growth, uh, I'm pretty impressed with what we've done in the last three years. So, so if I can just ask one follow-up. So, like, uh, the reason, so one thing is, you know, when you come back, let's say, in two or three quarters after discussing internally, 
the board and all. Will the 75 million ton by 20, 20, 27 number can change materially if you can give some thought on that? And secondly, I think I will. I I will let you know once we have discussed it internally and, uh, you know, we will make the announcement, uh, you know, when we are ready. Okay, okay, got it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will be taking only two last questions from the participants now. And the next question is from the line of Shravan Shah from Dalit Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, thank you, sir. <clears throat> Sir, uh, uh, continuing the previous question, so let's say even if we, as you mentioned, uh, even if we decide uh, 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 to take a couple of quarters to decide to for a 75 MTPA, uh, let's say three quarters down the line, even if you say we want to uh, uh, reach to a 75, then also is it possible to reach 75 million ton by FR27 because then you have only two year, two point two year, uh, only two year and three months. So is it possible even if we decide three year quarters down the line, can we reach 75 million ton by FR27? I think, uh, you know, uh, greenfield projects uh, are, uh, you know, may take two, two and a half years. We are seeing it in our northeast projects. Uh, it will take probably two years and three months to commission. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, commissioning new projects in this timeline is, is uh, not difficult based on our own execution track record and what we are seeing recently. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, you know, there could be possibilities of inorganic growth also. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, you know, that could get done faster. Uh, so I think uh, two, two and a half years is still a, you know, reasonably good time for us to, uh, you know, expand. Okay, okay. Uh, second, sir, when we uh, say that uh, we expect uh, eight and a half to nine percent kind of a demand growth for in FY25, and we want to grow at 1.5 times of the uh, uh, industry growth, so that comes uh, closer to a kind of a 12.75 or 13 percent versus last quarter we were saying that for next six seven years we can look at at 15 to 16 percent kind of a, a kegger. Uh, so uh, does that mean that? Uh, uh, if the start of the uh, this 15, 16 percent CAGR is on the lower side, uh, your ask rate uh, for the for to achieve this will be higher, or will this uh, uh, growth of 15, 16 percent CAGR for next six, seven years can can lower to a 12, 13 percent? I think we said we can do 12, 13 percent without JP assets, and JP assets can add another four, five percent to our growth. So I think that 15, 16 percent CAGR, including JP, will continue. Okay. Uh, second is in terms of the uh, uh, capex. Uh, is it possible any any broad idea? Though I I know uh, we haven't finalized to reach to a 75 MTPA, uh, but for FR26, uh, uh, what uh, uh, number one can can look at in terms of the capex? I think we have already commented on it on both the JP transaction and the fact that we are going to announce our uh, 75 million whenever we are ready for the next phase of expansion. So I think. Uh, there's nothing more to share at this moment. Okay, and on the em employee cost, uh, this quarter it has uh, uh, come down from the last uh, Q3 from 221 crore to 202. Uh, so, <clears throat> is there anything, any any one off, or is this uh, sustainable, or uh, when can we see normal uh, increment uh, for the employees, and how one can look at the quarterly employee cost uh, uh, from the Q1 FR25 onwards? Uh, Mr. Singhi earlier was on the roles of the company and he moved as a strategic advisor. So his cost uh, has, uh, under the new agreement, has moved to other expenses from the employee cost. So that is one significant change. Okay. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Jyoti Gupta from Nirmal Bank. Please go ahead. Uh, good, uh, good morning, sir. So my channel tech suggests that, you know, the prices have been dropped specifically in the south and east, and uh, the drop has come from you and the peers. And, of course, that is basically to maintain market share. And if, uh, as you said, in a very uh, in a subtle way to maintain market share, the prices may not improve. Now, that is actually going to increase the, uh, you know, uh, uh, deter the entire industry profitability also. So, just to, you know, because, you know, the companies are increasing their uh, capacity, 
So obviously they have to show a minimum utilization of 70%, which means will the prices continue to take that beating just to maintain market share? And second is, I see that the raw material cost uh, for all, I mean, for the last three, four quarters have not improved. It continues to be at the same level or higher. And if that is so the case, then your EBITDA button for the next three quarters are not going to improve. I just want to understand your point of view on that. I think on the price side, I would say that, uh, you know, uh, we have not let the price drop. And um, I think uh, uh, there is, uh, you know, uh, uh, unprecedented, uh, you know, drop in the, in the, in the last quarter. Uh, which uh, we are we are not a significant player in each of these markets and uh, like for example even in Andhra Pradesh etc we are not a very significant player but it witnessed a significant price drop in Chhattisgarh we are not a significant player it witnessed a very significant price drop too so I think uh, you know it is not uh, it is not about uh, Dalmia leading the price drop also we can say in the central region where we are ramping up JP volumes uh, we are a very small pair in that region. Even that region had uh, price drops. So I think, uh, you know, this is not about, uh, you know, Dalmia's quest to increase uh, market share and consequently, uh, you know, causing prices to drop in the market. Uh, I think there is, a, there is a general tendency, what I believe, that whenever new capacities get commissioned, there is some turbulence in the market. And even though utilizations are gradually likely to improve, if demand growth grows at you know nine percent and supply growth is at six six, six to seven percent, uh, you know I think uh, when new capacity comes in, there is some turbulence in the market. Uh, the question you know for me is that over the long term, how is the industry structure going to look like? Over the long term, what are the structural demand drivers, and who are the people who are investing in the sector? So I think you know the the encouraging trend that I see is that the incumbents you know who have the maximum exposure in this sector are investing more in this sector. So I think, uh, you know, that's a, uh, you know, clear indication for me that they see a long-term promise and they see, uh, you know, a high returns. Otherwise, they would not be spending so much money. Now, the question is that will that return come in a few quarters? Will that return come in a few years? Or you have to be patient for three to five years to get those returns? I think uh, that is the answer. Nobody knows uh, what the answer is. But we truly believe we have seen sector after sector after sector, you know, whether you see steel or banking or telecom, you know, as consolidation happens, industry structure becomes more attractive and, um, you know, margins improve and, you know, people who have built scale, uh, you know, before that, uh, you know, consolidation get a disproportionate reward. So I think this, this, uh, this journey requires some patience. This journey requires a slightly more longer term view as opposed to a quarter-on-quarter -quarter view. And I think you have to keep your head to the ground when prices are low, and you have to, you know, not fly high when prices are high. You have to just remain grounded. You have to remain focused on execution. And I think if you are focused and disciplined on execution, ultimately, you know, you will get margins and good returns in this sector. At least that's our conviction. Now, you know, let us see how it plays out. You know, nobody knows the future, but we are investing based on this thesis. We are betting on India. We are betting on an improving industry structure. We are betting on an industry where incumbents are, you know, investing more. And that makes, that makes us believe that, you know, um, our conviction is not shaken by just a few quarters of, uh, uh, you know, weak profitability or, uh, you know, volatility in, you know, prices or costs. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, as that was the last question for today, I would now like to hand the conference over to Mr. Puneet Dalmia for closing comments. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. I, you know, greatly appreciate your interest in us. And uh, again, as I said, this was a quarter with, uh, you know, good volumes, but we also had severe price drops uh, and, uh, you know, uh, higher costs. I think this, the our cost structure should improve as we go forward. And, um, you know, we look forward to interacting with you more uh, in the coming quarters. Thank you. Thank you, members of the management. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Dalmia Bharat Limited, that concludes this conference. We thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines. Thank you.